This afternoon's third presenter is Lord Mancroft, member of the Parliament. The third Baron Mancroft is a sitting Conservative peer of Lords. Lord Mancroft is a haunting man to his fingertips and has a well-known interest in conservation. He has hunted hounds himself and was, until recently, chairman of the Masters of Foxhounds Association. He is also the chairman of the UK's Standing Conference on Countryside Sports and Wildlife Management, a post he has held since, since 2009. He will speak to the One with Nature conference about the political aspects of protecting our hunting tradition. And Mr. Williams, please welcome to the stage Lord Mancraft's presentation, if you would like. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to talk to you today about the political debate around hunting in the United Kingdom and our experiences, and what, if anything, our friends in Europe can learn from our experiences. I, like a lot of people here, have shot game all over the world, but mostly in the UK, all my life, and for the last 50 years or so. But I'm primarily a fox hunter in the, in the English tradition, which means that I'm a practitioner of a 300-year-old sport of hunting foxes with hounds on horseback. Many of you will have seen pictures of fox hunting, and some of you may have been lucky enough to participate in it yourselves. Shooting grouse in the north of England in, or Scotland is one of the most exciting things you can do, with birds flying at up to 150 kilometers per hour. Catching salmon on a fly is another of na the natural world's great adventures. Stalking deer, as many people do in Hungary, across the moors or, or in the forests or in any habitat is also an abs absorbing, exciting and fascinating thing to do. But for those of us that were lucky enough to be brought up to it, fox hunting is our passion, the most intellectually fascinating, physically challenging and emotionally exciting thing that you can ever do. The sound of a pack of hounds makes when it is hunting is the most exciting music on earth and the challenge presented by trying to follow a pack of hounds hunting hard across big country still makes the hairs stand up on my very old neck. Since the sport was first developed in the 18th century, following agriculture and economic changes in the British countryside, and throughout the following 300 years, men and women have devoted a vast amount of time, money and energy into breeding packs of hounds, buying expensive horses, planting and maintaining suitable habitats, organizing large tracts of the countryside with the sole object of providing the best sport possible. During all of that period, the object of the sport, the red fox, was increasingly venerated and was protected. His reputation as a species grew in stature. He was painted in art, written of in prose and poetry. Foxes were given perfect woods in which to live, a closed season, so they could rear their young, protected from angry farmers and poultry keepers. And in return for this worship, they were hunted for about half the year and probably had to face the hounds in practice about five or six times each year. And in the event that they were caught, their death was almost instantaneous, a lot kinder than many of the deaths that we're going to face at the end of our lives. In the last decade, of legal hunting, hunts in England killed about 12,000 foxes each year across the country out of a population of about 500,000. We know these figures are pretty accurate because the hunting community provided the field workers for a comprehensive national count of foxes in the 1990s. Probably the most comprehensive piece of research of its kind ever undertaken and paid for by the fox hunters because only they really cared enough to commission and undertake that job of work. When I was a boy and later on a young man, we were justifiably proud of the fact that we in the UK had the largest, most stable, healthy population of foxes in the world. Because, I would argue, there was across the whole country a network of people who love foxes and were prepared to put in the time and spend the money to achieve that wonderful population. That is the fox hunters who love their quarry and love to hunt them in equal parts as hunters love and care for their quarry wherever it is across the world. And that is the most important message that we have to get out. But that all ceased, it stopped dead at the stroke of a pen in 2004 
as Rob said a few minutes ago, the UK Labour government pushed through Parliament a law banning fox hunting, and a 300-year-old sporting tradition was thrown away like a piece of rubbish without a second thought. 34 years ago, back in 1987, I became a master of foxhounds, effectively the head of a hunt. To my mind, the most wonderful job in the world. At exactly the same time, coincidentally, I also became a member of the House of Lords, the second chamber of the British Parliament. Because of this coincidence, I found myself thrown into the political battle for hunting, where I've found myself ever since. It's impossible to escape from, as I'm sure you can imagine. I'd like to share with you what happened, some of its consequences, and what lessons we country people and our friends in Europe and around the world can learn from what happened to us. It is important to recognize that nine out of 10 people in the United Kingdom are at least five generations away from living in the land, the, on the land. We are therefore virtually entirely an urban society where few people and very few voters have any understanding of the countryside, wi countryside wildlife, and ways of nature. Politicians and lawmakers are easily swayed by popular sentiment and will respond to pressure from Facebook and Twitter rather than be guided by science or by those who have a deep understanding of life in the countryside. There are votes on Twitter and Facebook. There are very few votes in the countryside, and they find it difficult to make their voices heard above the urban clamor. Now, in Europe, you have many different political parties, and most governments are made up of coalitions, although we too had a coalition in between 2010 and 2015 in the UK. That was the first time for 50 years since, since the last war. In the UK, there are really two main political parties. The most successful is the Conservative Party, which currently Boris Johnson leads, you may have heard of him, and which forms the present government. It's also the leading party of the coalition a few years ago. The Conservative Party has been called the natural party of government in the United Kingdom. Although it evolved from the 19th century Tory party, it shares much of its DNA. It was the traditional party of the countryside, of farmers and landowners, of wealth owners and wealth creators, and of the professional classes. The other main party is the Labour Party, the party of the industrial working classes that emerged from the trade union movement the start, at the end of the, of the start of the 19th century. It is rooted in the factories, mines, and shipyards and, of, of the country, and, and it has evolved, as, as heavy industry has faded, it has evolved into the party of government and local authority employees, and the party of those who immigrated from, to the UK from Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Middle East over the last 30 years. The Labour Party has virtually no rural votes. This is not dissimilar to other European countries, although each country is structured slightly differently. There is, however, one factor which I think is largely unique to UK politics. If the issue of race, racial tensions, and racial divide is the poison that runs through American politics, then I believe that the poison that runs through British politics is class and class warfare and the politics of envy. There is a visceral hatred within the parts of the Labour Party of what they perceive as the remnants of the old aristocratic ruling classes this encompasses the landowners and the owners of the factories, shipyards, and mines whose fortunes were made on the backs of the workers. The cla this classic caricature of these symbols of evil capitalism are fox hunters in their red coats on their expensive horses, arrogantly galloping wherever they please. You may think this sounds like a lesson in ancient history, but it is very real to some elements within the left in British politics, and it is never far from the surface. Only last weekend, at their annual conference, the deputy leader of the Labour Party referred to members of the Conservative government as scum, not the sort of language you would expect to hear in modern politics, but it is the reality. So you have two parties in Britain, one traditionally of the countryside and the other urban-based. And within that urban party, a deep-seated hatred of the other, and looking to hurt it. That is unique to Britain. But what is not unique to the UK, but exists throughout Europe and the United States now, is a new and unpleasant phenomenon, which is the animal rights movement. The old-fashioned animal welfare movement was something which most of us had great sympathy and to which we gave our support. No one should be cruel to animals, whether domestic, pets, farm animals, or wildlife. 
but that, that should not mean that we are sentimental. We recognize that man uses animals for food, clothing, recreation, and sport, and also for the furtherance of science and medicine. In all of this, we have a duty, an important duty, to ensure that the suffering of animals is kept to a minimum, and that at the right time, they are afforded a quick and respectful death. That is not the same as giving animals rights. Whilst we have a duty of care for animals, animals do not themselves have legal rights because with rights come responsibilities. And I think it is in itself a form of abuse to accord to animals responsibilities which they cannot possibly undertake. Some people within the animal welfare movement cannot accept any use of animals in any circumstances. They're quite entitled to that view, but they're not entitled to force it on others. As the 20th century has progressed, the animal welfare movement took root within the Labour Party in the United Kingdom. By the time of the first post-war Labour government, it had grown within the party. One of the first campaigns it focused on was a campaign to abolish hunting with hounds. It was popular within the party because it was perceived that hunting, as I said, was the sport of the aristocratic landowners. The Labour government, on the other hand, were not quite so keen to get involved in this debate. They regarded it as a, as a sideshow from the more important issues. They therefore commissioned an independent report into the welfare aspects of hunting to see if it was cruel. The report, called the Scott Henderson Report, concluded that foxes needed to be controlled and that of the available methods, shooting, gassing, snaring, trapping and hunting, hunting was likely to cause the least suffering and resulted either in a clean death or the quarry escaped unharmed. On this basis, the Labour government did not support the ban and the bill failed. That was in the year 1949. For the next 40 years, there were repeated attempts by individual members of parliament to introduce bans of one sort or another on deer hunting, hare hunting, hare coursing, and also fox hunting. But without government support, they all inevitably failed. Throughout the years when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, there, were not, there was no practical possibility of a ban going through parliament but a bill introduced by a Labour MP in 1992 was only defeated by a handful of votes. I remember this well because I was involved at the time, and although we won, we won by only a tiny handful of votes, and we therefore revealed to our enemies our weakness. If, therefore, a Labour government was elected with a working majority at some stage in the future, it looked inevitable that a ban would be enacted. The political interests of hunting had been looked after for over 50 years by a small society which knew an awful lot about hunting and shooting and fishing, but not a lot about modern politics and communications. So from 1992 onwards, a group of hunting people put together a broad-based political organization charged with the defense of all hunting activities, but primarily fox hunting, as that was the main activity under political attack. We raised significant amounts of money from our community and we built a modern political campaigning organization. The organization became the Countryside Alliance. At its height, it had 120,000 members and an income of over 4 million a year and a staff of over 40 people. I served as its deputy chairman for 15 years and chairman for two. Its remit was to build the case for hunting by undertaking public research into, into attitudes, scientific research into all aspects of wildlife and species management and all the relevant welfare aspects as well as the economics of rural life. Over the, and put those together to build a case for why hunting was a positive force in the countryside. Over the course of the next decade, the Countryside Alliance achieved most of its goals in terms of unifying the rural community, building and disseminating to politicians, journalists, and the general public the case for wildlife management. It was called conservation in those days, and in particular, all the arguments in favor of hunting. It wasn't all good, of course. There, con there continued to be the usual press stories and photographs of unfortunate hunting incidents, and our people continue to say and do stupid things on camera from time to time. We won some parts of the debate and we failed to win others. Many of you will have had experience of political campaigns and political lobbying. It isn't a simple business. It also has to be remembered that we were faced with an enemy that had an apparently unlimited funds and was determined to destroy us. We learned to our cost that throughout the 1970s and 80s, the animal rights movement had very effectively infiltrated the Labour Party at almost every level, but in particular at a local constituency level. That meant that many Labour members of Parliament had received money and practical assistance from these various organisations. 
A number of organizations, in particular PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and IFOR, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, raise money in places like the United States and other countries, and then transfer those funds to the UK to buy expensive advertising campaigns that we could never match. I4 always seems to me to be a money-raising exercise. They jump on the back of any animal-related story that emerges, hunting in England, bullfighting in Spain, whales in Norway, seals in Canada. They have successfully tapped into the urban, uninformed world of the Walt Disney view of animals, and they milk them for cash, which they spend very successfully against us. Some years ago, a member of the International Union of Hunting with, as, a, as a member of the International Union of Hunting with Hounds, an organisation made up of hunting people from Britain, Ireland, France, United States, Belgium, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, we spent two days with Face in Brussels. On a visit to the European Parliament, we were horrified to find the whole building full of an exhibition against farm animals by PETA, funded by the Humane Society of the United States. We recognised that the election of Tony Blair government in 1997 posed a critical threat to hunting. The government had a large majority and was strongly opposed to hunting. However, the Prime Minister and the party leaders had no interest in a subject they regarded as a distraction from their own political agenda. It is difficult, standing here today, to explain what it was like. We were under siege in the newspapers every day, and there were television debates, parliamentary questions, and constant um, argument and confrontation. We also faced an extraordinary level of violent protest out hunting in the countryside, which Rob talked about in his, in his address a few minutes ago. Hunts would find 20, 30, 50, even 100 masked paramilitary thugs, some armed, all abusive, with cameras following us round on hunting days, threatening, abusing, attacking professional hunt staff. The rural police were either unwilling or incapable of dealing with that level of activism. Whenever an incident occurred, it would be followed by damaging stories and photographs in the press. We were portrayed as violent, abusive people who enjoyed hurting animals. At the same time, the government came under increasing pressure from its own supporters, who were in turn the object of personal lobbying by animal rights activists from within their own local parties. The Home Secretary of the day therefore appointed a new committee of inquiry into hunting in December 1999, which reported the following June. The wording of the report, as we've already heard, was so convoluted that it enabled both sides to claim victory. In practical terms, the government, it brought the government a year's respite, but did not, as the government had hoped, resolve anything. The government therefore introduced a bill containing three options, leaving things as they are, completely banning hunting, or a system of licensing, which would actually have amounted to a virtual ban. The two houses of parliament failed to agree and the bill fail, fell when a general election was called. A further meaningless vote took place by the new government in 2001, and a new minister convened a three-day hearing at Westminster, inviting all interested parties to give evidence. In a further attempt to find a solution to what had become an intractable political problem, which was damaging distraction for the government. What was perfectly clear to those of us who were involved at the time was there was now a majority in the House of Commons in favour of banning hunting who were not interested in the facts of science but were only intent on a political solution that satisfied their prejudices. During this time, the rural community mounted some extraordinary public protests and demonstrations. Whenever a government minister appeared in public, in any part of the country, he was met by a crowd of angry hunting supporters. 100,000 people rallied in Hyde Park in central London one Saturday, perhaps the largest get political gathering since the Vietnam War, but completely peaceful. The following year, there was a march through the streets of London, a quarter of a million people in support, and in 2004, another march when 400,000 people again protested, marched to protect their way of life. This was the largest political march the United Kingdom has ever seen, and there is no doubt that it amazed the political establishment and caught the government off balance. But the important point to make is that it had absolutely no effect. The government rapidly worked out that spread thinly amongst 64 million people, the 400,000 marchers were an irrelevance. They had never voted Labour, they never would, and they lived in parts of the country which were not represented by Labour MPs. 
So impressive as these demonstrations were, they posed no threat to the government. The Prime Minister, Tony Blair, had later admitted that he neither knew nor cared anything about hunting. What he really meant was that he knew or cared nothing about rural voters and rural votes, and he had no interest in countryside and rural issues, certainly not in wildlife or hunting of any sort, all of which he found pretty distasteful. In this, he reflected accurately the views of most Democrat, social democrat politicians throughout Europe. So the government proceeded to ignore the findings of their own report, ignore all the scientific evidence, ignore the voices of those people involved in hunting and looking after the wilder parts of Britain, and introduce a new bill into Parliament to ban hunting with hounds. After a year of parliamentary debates amounting to around 400 hours, probably more time than has been devoted to any other political issue, and significantly more parliamentary time than was ever devoted to the Iraq war, it was clear that the two Houses of Parliament would never agree. The Labour-dominated House of Commons was un voted overwhelmingly for a ban, and the House of Lords voted equally overwhelmingly against a ban. There is, however, a mechanism in the British Constitution to resolve part disputes between the two Houses of Parliament, but it is only used in extreme circumstances for very important issues, and certainly not for a subject of virtually no interest to 90% of voters. Astonishingly, the government decided that this was the right time to employ that constitutional measure. A sledgehammer of last resort has only been used three times in the last 100 years. But use it they did, and so in 2004, hunting with hounds was effectively banned in the UK. I say effectively because at the 11th hour, the government lost control of its own bill. The two members of parliament, both well-known class warriors and animal rights obsessives, with legal drafting assistance from the animal rights movements, substantially amended the bill to insert their own extreme wording. However, such was their ignorance about the realities and practicalities of hunting, they produced a law that is almost impossible to enforce and that the courts have the greatest difficulty in interpreting. Writing in a national newspaper shortly after the bill became law, Peter Bradley, a member of parliament and parliamentary secretary to the minister who took the bill through parliament, wrote, we ought at last to own up to it. The struggles over this bill was not about animal welfare and personal freedom. It was class war. And that, ladies and gentlemen, you have it. Later on in his memoirs, Tony Blair also wrote that banning hunting was the thing he most regretted of his 10 years in, as prime minister. During the first years, quite a few hunts after the ban, quite a few hunts and huntsmen landed in court facing charges of illegal hunting. A number were convicted, and the majority of these convictions were overturned on appeal by a higher court. Those who were convicted faced relatively small fines, approximately the equivalent of serious driving offences. Over the last three years, there have been nine prosecutions of hunts under the Hunting Act. All these prosecutions have failed. But hunts can face constant and sometimes daily harassment from animal rights extremists who make almost daily complaints to the police, which they are obliged to investigate, albeit not always very thoroughly. After all, you can imagine the police have, do have better things to do than follow hunts around all day, see if they are breaking a law that no one really understands and that has no victim. Please forgive me if I've given you too much detail about the campaign we faced and the battles we fought, but I believe it's important that we understand the lengths our enemies will go to destroy our way of life wherever we live. I have no idea if you will face similar battles here in Hungary or in other parts of countries of Europe, although I have observed a similar situation starting to arise in France over the last few years. There are campaigns against hunting in Ireland and to a lesser extent in the United States. And as we've heard already, in Northern Ireland there is currently a bill to ban hunting there before the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I don't know whether or not it will succeed. I'm not well informed enough about the different political part parties and the, and the makeup of Hungary or other European countries, so it's difficult to make direct comparisons or predictions about what may or may not happen. But there are lessons we can all learn. In every country in Europe, there is a growing divide between town and country. As more and more people are born and grow up in cities, and they understand less and less about the realities of country life, which makes them willing to accept, less willing to accept things like hunting. The animal rights movement is big, it's rich, and it's growing all over the world. A mixture of animal rights propaganda, and that so many children are raised on a diet of Disney movies in which animals behave, think, and express emotions in the same way as human beings, means that people are detached from death, 
and in particular from the cycle of life and death in the natural world. This leads to a growth in widespread ignorance about wildlife and the role of hunting in maintaining the balance of species. The Green Movement is not about managing the environment so much as blaming those of us who have been managing for the last few generations. The growing view that humans should not be managing the rural environment at all, that animals should be left to their own devices, may be wrong, but it is growing in popularity and it needs to be addressed. It's up to us, those of us who hunt, who know and understand about wildlife all over Europe to explain and teach that what we do in our way of life is valid. Silence is not an option. The Green Movement and the Animal Rights Movement are gaining more and more credence every year. But when they move into mainstream politics and start to infiltrate existing political parties, they become more dangerous. And it was when the animal rights movement infiltrated one of the two major political parties in the United Kingdom and focused the intention on one small target hunting that they were able to win. But it doesn't stop there. We, haven't, we have seen what that when they score one victory, they move on to the next, one step at a time, as we've already been talking about. Shooting sports under threat, their increasing attacks on equestrian sports like horse racing, and their promotion of veganism is an attack on farmers and anyone who owns livestock. The battle has only just started, but what happened to hunting in England could happen across Europe unless we actively work to defeat it. I'd like to leave the last word to the most important player in this terrible farce, the fox. What happened to the English fox? Well, the fox is a major predator in an ecosystem that is now virtually entirely man-made, where he competes with farmers, landowners, and other animals in an increasingly complex and crowded world. Everyone, except the most extreme greens in this debate, accepts that foxes and their population need to be managed. Through hunting, we had developed over many years a method that ensured foxes had enough suitable habitat, a closed season in which to breed and rear their young in relative safety, and a method of culling that removed the sick and older animals first, guaranteed a clean kill, and left no wounded animals. A system that most closely replicated the natural world's survival of the fittest by simply shaving numbers, excess numbers off the top, but only when and where necessary. That system is now illegal and has been replaced by one in which habitat is slowly depleting, there is no closed season, and in particular, nursing females are killed, leaving cubs to starve. Most culling is now done using long-range rifles on a farm-by-farm -farm basis without reference to local populations and by its very nature takes those foxes found in the open, which results in a degree of wounding and invariably leads to the culling of younger, healthier foxes whilst failing to remove old and sick specimens. It is difficult to imagine a worse system of species management. The hunting community, which spent 300 years nurturing the fox population, is now prevented by law from playing a meaningful role in their conservation and management. The British Trust for Ornithology, a respected national charity, in its 2018 study of British mammals, which is widely accepted as accurate, found that since the ban on hunting, the fox population of the United Kingdom has collapsed by 40%, which is slightly more than the fall in the elephant population in Africa over the same 15-year period. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a man-made disaster. Thank you very much.